Thank you very much, Raj. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for including uh, this work on the program. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Um, so today uh, I want to talk about um, how and if the furlough program in the UK um, resulted in household financial distress during the pandemic. And this is uh, based on joint work with Danny McGowan and Mallory Irmanaus. So as Rush already uh, has said in his introduction, we had a number of uh, national uh, lockdowns in the UK, um, and these coincided with the introduction of the coronavirus job retention scheme, the UK's version of a furlough scheme. Um, the first national lockdown um, for uh, all those who are not so familiar with this uh, was implemented in March 2020, and it was much more severe than in some other countries. It involved uh, stay-at-home policies and ban on non-essential business and travel. So in principle, this could have resulted in mass unemployment because uh, it, it involves a very realistic possibility uh, that if, uh, if employers have to shut down operations and uh, do so fully or at least partially. Um, now, to prevent this, the government introduced a number of economic policies, and the cornerstone was really the coronavirus job retention scheme. Under this scheme, the government contributed 80% uh, of an individual's gross wages up to £2,500 per month. Um, the remaining 20% could either be paid uh, by um, the employer or um, the employer could abstain from, uh, from paying any, any contribution. Um, a furlough scheme has, has many um, advantages. And uh, as Raj said earlier, it has been uh, employed, such schemes have been employed very successfully um, in other countries, for example, in France, in Switzerland, or in Germany, um, prior to the um, pandemic. In Germany and Switzerland, for example, it was very effective in mitigating the adverse effects of the 2007-2008 financial crisis. But in the UK, um, this is the first uh, instance of a furlough scheme that has been introduced. And um, so it's very worth uh, studying its effects on society uh, and its economic effects. Uh, an, an important advantage is in, in conjunction with national lockdowns that a uh, furlough scheme retains employer-employee relationships so that business activities can be reactivated very quickly again once a lockdown is lifted. Um, on the employer side, a furlough scheme um, uh, reduces the wage bill and thereby um, uh, mitigates cost pressures that firms have due to lockdown. And on the household or individual uh, level side, um, it prevents large negative income shocks that may come uh, with, with unemployment. In the UK, the coronavirus job the retention scheme ended in September 2021, but it was uh, um, faded out slowly um, and already from June the 10th uh, on employees who had not been furloughed previously could not enter the scheme anymore. This is just a brief overview about the timeline that we will uh, be considering in our study and you can see uh, in gray the bars in gray indicate the national lockdowns and these coincided with a, a huge uptake in the furlough scheme uh, during each lockdown and then uh, during the lockdown and particularly once the lockdown ended um, firms um, started to re-employ employees uh, again on, on a regular basis um, and uh, deregister them from the furlough scheme. Now how important are actually the income reductions that, that individuals faced from being furloughed? Well, I've just mentioned uh, a lot of advantages of the furlough scheme. It clearly comes with a severe or potentially severe income shock because the government doesn't pay the entire wage of an individual. And this figure can give us a, an indication about this. You see the decline in income here 
on the x-axis, and about 35% of individuals in, in the sample um, face no or a very, very small income shock. But the average um, reduction in income is 17%. And you can see that a, a substantial number of people um, even faced much, much larger income shocks. So um, while the, the corona, coronavirus job retention scheme was certainly extremely um, helpful in preventing mass unemployment and in preventing a, a large income shock that is associated uh, from um, uh, by this, um, it, clearly it came along for some individuals still with a severe income shock. And for this reason, do we ask in our study um, the following questions? Um, our paper goes a little bit beyond this, but this is uh, what I want to touch on today. And we want to ask, um, is, the is the furlough scheme associated with financial distress that results from these income shocks? Um, are these effects equal across the society or are there implications for inequality uh, due to the furlough scheme? And how do households actually stabilize their finances or how do they uh, try to prevent uh, financial distress from being furloughed? These are three questions that touch the, um, the behavior of in individuals during the pandemic. We also address one uh, question that uh, asks about how optimal is the design of the coronavirus job retention scheme. And this is a very important a question because uh, the furlough scheme um, is it's the first time we roll out the, the scheme in the UK and uh, what we can learn from other countries is limited because uh, every country has somewhat different so social security networks etc so it's important to consider the case for the UK and this scheme has been uh, an extremely heavy burden on public finances to date it, uh, it costs almost uh, 70 billion pounds uh, to subsidize wages, which amounts to about 8% of annual government expenditure. So it's very important to understand whether these funds, taxpayers' finances have been used effectively. Um, also in case there might be uh, future instances when a furlough scheme might be required again. Our study is based on uh, the COVID-19 uh, special survey by uh, Understanding Society, which uh, Raj mentioned earlier already. Um, we use eight of the waves of this survey between April 2020 and April 2021. And this spans almost the entire time um, during which furloughed workers could, uh, or during which workers could newly be registered for the furlough. Uh, scheme. And this, this survey is, is really fantastic. It, it provides a, a really rich and very novel picture of how individuals behaved during the pandemic. So it's a very, very valuable survey. And for us, um, while there are many, many variables uh, which allow a very detailed picture, we focus on, on variables that relate to financial distress, such as um, individuals being late on housing payments or late on bill payments. But uh, we also have very detailed information, for example, on the furlough start and end dates, whether people have tested positive for shielding or whether they have, um, whether they have participated in other government policies to mitigate the effects of the financial crisis. We merge this special uh, COVID-19 survey with the Understanding Society's um, 2017 to 2019 uh, survey vintages. And that allows us to um, uh, rely on information on individuals prior to the pandemic. Um, for example, we get some in indication on the history of financial distress on the pre-pandemic income and savings behavior, et cetera. In our sample, we include only those individuals who can actually be furloughed. Um, so we exclude self-employed uh, retirees and unemployed uh, individuals who could not be furloughed under the coronavirus job retention scheme. 
Um, both surveys, the regular Understanding Society survey and the special coverage survey uh, use a complex design. Uh, and um, this allows us to attach weights to observations uh, so that our results are representative for the UK population. Um, it also requires some uh, econometric techniques to deal with this, which, which we um, do. So what do we do um, in detail? We, um, the results I show you today re rely on probit estimators, <clears throat> where we uh, have uh, the following regression equation on the left-hand side. Uh, we include a measure of financial distress, uh, YIRT, which uh, where I denotes an individual, R the region, and uh, T the wave. Um, we use two particular measures uh, to uh, understand whether somebody is in financial distress. Um, for once, we, uh, we rely on whether an individual is late in the payments of their bills. Uh, and the household bills. And the second indicator is whether somebody is late in terms of the payment for payments for housing, so either mortgage payments or uh, rent payments. Um, F is a uh, furlough dummy. That is one if somebody is furloughed and zero otherwise. X is a vector of control variables and deltas, the deltas are fixed effects. <clears throat> And the decision to furlough uh, a worker is taken by the employer to optimize the company's business operations and to ensure firm survival. So simultaneity bias is therefore unlikely to exist in this equation. With this equation, we do not claim causal interpretations, but we provide uh, correlative evidence. However, in robustness exercises, we also employ propensity score matching estimators, um, which then allow us to make um, causal, uh, causal statements as well. So, and let's uh, get straight to the results. Um, here, we consider the, the indicator of uh, an individual being late on housing for financial distress to indicate financial distress. And if we consider the entire sample here in this, uh, in this column, then you can see that furlough is associated with an approximately two percentage point increase in the probability of being late on housing payments. If you only consider, uh, consider those in the sample who, who rent, uh, then this is even slightly higher. Here furlough is associated maybe with a, uh, two, uh, with a three, uh, and a half percent increase in the probability of late housing payments. Interestingly, uh, for those who have a mortgage, the effect is not significantly different from zero because the confidence interval here crosses the zero line. A very similar picture emerges if we use uh, being late on household bills as an indicator for financial distress. Um, again, in the entire sample, a furlough is associated with an approximately 4%, uh, sorry, 4 percentage point increase in the probability of uh, um, being late on bills. And again, the effect is slightly stronger for those who rent, but insignificant for mortgages. So to recap this, furlough is associated with an approximately 2 percentage point increase in the probability of late housing payments. And this equates to an 85% increase in the probability of financial distress relative to a non-furloughed person. And similarly, um, furlough is associated with a four percentage point increase in the probability of late bill payments, and that equates to an enormous 31% increase in the probability of financial distress relative, again, to a non-furloughed person. And despite these large relative effects. Furlough has quite modest effects on financial distress for the overall UK workforce. It increases the aggregate incidence of financial distress by only just under two percentage points. We have seen uh, from this figure that there is a slightly different results between those who rent and uh, mortgagees. And one uh, reason we find for this is that mortgagees uh, can um, 
generate or extra cash or they can free up some cash flow and by participating in the government's mortgage holiday scheme. This is a um, policy that was also rolled out during the pandemic um, that allowed mortgagees to defer housing payments for uh, three to six months. So house, households and individuals could free up some cash, um, which allowed them then uh, to avoid being late on mortgages and potentially pay household bills. And for renters, such a scheme did not exist. Next, I would like to come to the question of how optimal is the design of the furlough scheme in the UK? One could think, for example, that well, to, pre to pre prevent or mitigate financial distress even more, the government could have paid 90% of an individual's uh, wages rather than just 80%. Um, it's, on the other hand, what one could argue, well, um, this scheme was a very heavy burden on public finances, so maybe it would have been sufficient um, to only contribute 60% to an individual's wages, uh, which is, for example, the number um, in Germany, even though the design of the scheme is slightly different there. So it's a very important question. And uh, this figure can provide some indications um, uh, towards answering this question. We see here on the x-axis, again, the decline in income due to furlough. And on the y-axis, we see the probability of late payments, of e either housing or bill payments. Um, so on the, on the y-axis, we have a measure of financial distress. You can see that this curve is almost linear in this part up to about 20% decline in income due to furlough, but then increases exponentially. So um, that means if the government would have contributed more than the 80% to individual wages on average, uh, then um, the average decline in income would have moved from the 17% so, somewhere to the left. However, it would not have substantially mitigated uh, financial distress on average. So higher contributions would have been very costly for the taxpayer, but would have had a very limited effect on um, mitigating, uh, mitigating UK-wide financial distress. On the other hand, if a government would have decided to apply only a 60% contribution, then um, we would be somewhere here potentially around the 40% income uh, decline due to furlough on average. And you can see that um, financial distress, the probability of financial distress would have doubled. So due to um, the shape of this curve, um, we can say that um, uh, the coronavirus job retention schemes design is quite optimal in the sense that an 80% government contribution to uh, furloughed workers' wages minimizes the incidence of financial distress at the lowest cost to the taxpayer. Next, I would like to uh, tell you about how individuals adjusted um, to these income shocks, uh, furlough-induced income shocks. Well, it's not surprising that individuals have reduced their expenditure and have drawn down their savings. But I think the quantitative effects we find are quite substantial and worth documenting. So furlough provokes a 20 percentage point increase in the probability that an individual cuts their spending and a seven percentage point increase in the probability that an individual um, spends their savings. And it's very important uh, to note that the results on spending cuts persist even after a fur furloughed individual is back uh, in employment, in, in, in regular employment. So we find that post furlough, a person is about seven percentage point more likely to cut spendings relative to pre-pandemic levels. A reason for this can be that having experienced uh, being on furlough and the risk of um, financial distress. Um, this uncertainty results in people building up risk buffers of uh, funds because um, during our entire sample, it was always a realistic uh, possibility that a new uh, variant of COVID could trigger a new wave and necessitate a new round of national lockdowns and hence uh, furlough. 
So um, this is a very important finding that people um, adjusted their spending behavior even beyond the furlough spell because it has affected a large part of the UK workforce. Um, over, the, over our sample, um, uh, about a quarter of the UK workforce have been furloughed at least once. Before I finish, uh, let me briefly uh, say also something on whether furlough resulted in higher inequality. And um, we test how the furlough scheme uh, results in financial distress um, according to different segments in the society, and in particular in terms of income and in terms of educational background. And we find that furlough only raises the likelihood of financial distress for those individuals who have a below, me below median income and without and are without a university degree. We don't find a, a effect that is significantly different from zero for those who earn above median incomes and uh, who hold a university degree. So a potential explanation for this is that these groups differ in their pre-pandemic savings levels. Um, individuals earning above median income may accumulate savings that act as a buffer against financial distress. Um, and despite the positive effects of the coronavirus job retention scheme in preventing mass unemployment, it has adverse asymmetric effects, which are concentrated among those individuals with lower income and educational attainment. What I described earlier in terms of uh, furlough elicits uh, reductions in consumption and savings. This holds for all groups, but the effects again are larger for those uh, with low incomes and without a degree. And given that uh, we are running out of time, um, let me conclude here um, by briefly recapping. Um, I think we can come back to some of these points maybe during the Q&A session. Um, a number of our of, of, uh, robustness tests and falsification tests support all our results. I didn't have time to comment on these, but um, the key points to take away is that the furlough uh, increases the incidence of financial distress, but not to a large extent, on aggregate in the entire UK workforce, um, it raises the incidence of the furlough raises the incidence of financial distress by just under two percentage points. However, um, it has effects on uh, inequality in the sense that um, the incidence of furlough induced financial distress rises, in particular for those with the low median income and without a university degree. Being furloughed has lasting effects on individual consumption behavior. And we find that the coronavirus drop retention scheme is, is quite optimally designed in the sense that an 80% government contribution minimizes financial distress at the lowest cost to the taxpayers. Thank you very much.